This is your daily real estate syndication show, and I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Today is a highlight show that's packed with value from different guests around a specific topic. Don't forget to like and subscribe, but also go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can sign up to start investing in real estate today. I hope you enjoy the show. Our guest is Noah Rosenfarb. Thanks for being on the show again, Noah. Yeah, of course. Happy to be back. Let's move into just some general taxation stuff, and and uh, you know, take it, taking most advantage, uh, the most uh, most advantage as possible for the passive investor. And I think you can speak uh, a lot to that as well. So I think one of the predispositions I had because I was a practicing accountant. I come, I'm a third generation CPA, as you mentioned. My father had an accounting firm that I was a partner in for a decade. My father-in-law is a practicing tax accountant. You know, this is the type of dinner table conversation we had was around the tax code. And, you know, that's somewhat unusual. So, when one of the things I learned early on is that the uniqueness of our tax system is that it's self-reporting. So although a lot of people report to the government through different forms, like you know our K-1 that we receive in an investment, it's provided directly to the IRS by the company that we invested in. But then we take that K-1 and we have to report it on our Form 1040. Uh, people sometimes issue a Form 1099 if we collected interest. So they're reporting that to the government and then we report it on our 1040. A lot of the things that we do as individuals and as owners of, of enterprises is not reported directly to the government and the government's relying on us to self-report. And so because we're self-reporting, we get to make our own judgment as to what is it that we're going to report as income, what is it that we're going to report as expense, and how do we classify that? And the way that our system responds to that is by if they have a question, the IRS will write you a letter and say, dear taxpayer, you know, you you took this deduction or you we we believe you had this income. Can you please verify by providing us with your evidence? So, because of the nature of the way that we report, it gives us as taxpayers a lot more freedom than other tax jurisdictions where the government tells you exactly how much you owe. They complete the forms for you because everything's being reported on your behalf. And so, we want to use that flexibility to our advantage. We want to come up with ways that we could consider expenses to be business expenses or ways that we could consider our activities to qualify us as real estate professionals. So for individuals that are investing either as an LP or maybe sometimes they have a few units that they own directly and then they're making LP investments with other sponsors, if you can become a real estate professional, which doesn't require you to have a real estate brokerage license, but it does have other certain requirements, then the government allows you to deduct all of the depreciation from all of your assets against any other ordinary income you have. That's a massive advantage. And and so if you're listening and you've been actively engaged in the investment in real estate, but you're not currently a real estate professional, maybe you're still at a job that you get paid every two weeks and you receive a W-2 at the end of the year, that doesn't preclude you from being a real estate professional. And you want to be sure you're talking about that with your accountant and figuring out if there's some way that you or your spouse could qualify as a real estate professional. And, it, and it, it's, I'm glad you just mentioned you or your spouse. I mean, it's potential that may, if you don't qualify, maybe your spouse does. Yeah. And, and we see that a lot of times, you know, you've got maybe a doctor or a lawyer and their, their wife is in predominantly a homemaker. But if we can get them to classify as a real estate professional, it might be able to save them 50000 100000 150000 a year. So we, if we could keep a journal of the wife's activity looking for property every week, if we could keep a journal of the wife's activity interacting with tenants or discussing investment properties with their spouse or with their financial advisor, with their accountant, then we could start to build up their resume as a real estate professional. So what about thinking outside the box a little more? There are ways that you've seen for people to be able to find expenses that they can count as business expenses that we may not typically think of. You know, I think there there's a lot of things that we miss when it comes to the tax code. And it's not really the fault of our accountants. The accounting profession in general has been taught how to look very clearly through the rearview mirror and make out all of the details of what's happened in the past, but we're not taught to look out of the windshield and see what's coming. 
So as a profession, we're not incentivized to help taxpayers think about how do we avoid future taxes. We're only paid for return preparation in almost all cases. And I, you know, I just had someone that had approached me about doing some tax planning, and I told them to go back to their CPA firm to do a tax projection. And they were so miserably upset because the accountant just took their five months worth of numbers, multiplied it by 12 fifths and said, here's your year. And, you know, it was like, well, there was no thoughtfulness, there was no advice, there was no counsel. And I think that happens all too often in this industry. So be sure that if you're not getting tax advice from your current tax preparer, that you have someone else in your life that's helping you focus on how do we avoid future taxes, not just present day taxes. That was going to be something I wanted to ask you. You were you triggered in my mind there, even just, you know, hiring a tax strategist versus, you know, hiring our, you know, our CPA or accountant, somebody that we're speaking with, you know, often, you know, about what's happening in our finances and our taxes. But, you know, should we hire somebody that's an actual tax strategist, you know, and, and then also does that person then say, do our taxes or are they just more an advisor that will help us work with our current you know, CPA. Yeah, I found that in most instances, really good tax strategists make a lot of money. And because they make so much money, they're not good people to do tax compliance because tax compliance is in some sense a commodity. Recording history is not very valuable. So most tax strategists, either they don't do the preparation themselves or they don't even do it inside their firm. So you may work with a tax lawyer, you may work with a wealth manager, you may work with an estate planning attorney, someone that's maybe a little bit more sophisticated just on taxes, but not handling the preparation of your form 1040 for your personal return or not handling your business partnership returns. We wanna let somebody at a low cost do that type of work. And when it comes to the real creativity, critical thinking, that's the stuff where maybe we're paying $1,000 an hour or $2,000 an hour to someone who's incredibly brilliant. And we're not paying them for the hour that we're spending with us. We're paying them for the 20 years that they've spent learning exactly what to do with that hour. Very well said. That's with a lot of professions, right? When you're hiring somebody that's a professional advisor, it's well worth it. It seems like a lot per hour, but it's well worth it because of their experience. So, yeah. uh, you know, what about, uh, you know, I hear about this, uh, you know, you're getting the, the 4% tax rate on, on your income and, and I'd love for you to elaborate on uh, just structure, you know, how you've structured this to accomplish that. So, you know, maybe we could think the same way. Yeah. So b bear with me because, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an egghead in some sense that I love exploring the tax code and I love finding ways to beat the system. It's the game that gives me a lot of pleasure. It allows me and enables me to take the capital that I'm creating and use it in a way that justifies what, what I'm working for. And, you know, that does include causes that I care about and contributing to things that I want to make a difference, but I don't enjoy funding our government. So I came up with a strategy that's quite unique. Puerto Rico came out with tax incentives a few years ago. The island of Puerto Rico had really great incentives for pharmaceutical companies to come and manufacture their drugs there. And they started that in the 1980s and they built dozens and thousands of jobs in the pharmaceutical space, in pharmaceutical manufacturing. And then they took away those incentives. <laughs> and, and what lo and behold, all those companies left the island. And so they, they looked around and said, oh, I guess that wasn't a good idea. Well, what could we do now? And they said, let's try and invite entrepreneurs to set up their business here and for retirees to come live on our island to enjoy their retirement. And they came out with two significant tax codes, which were formerly called Act 20 and Act 22, now commonly called Act 60. And what they did for businesses is they said, if you come and open your business in Puerto Rico, we'll agree for 20 years, we'll only charge you a 4% corporate tax rate. So think about that. Right now, the IRS is, is currently at a historic low corporate tax rate of 21%. Certain states apply an additional tax rate on top of that. But Puerto Rico is saying 4%, that's all in. You don't pay IRS federal taxes when you're a a Puerto Rico based business. You don't pay any state income taxes when you're based in Puerto Rico. So I like that. I thought that was a unique incentive. And so I went and set up a company in Puerto Rico with this 4% tax rate. But I did one extra thing because a corporation, when it issues a dividend to a shareholder, that shareholder has to pay dividend income tax. And if you live in Puerto Rico and you receive a dividend from your Puerto Rican company, you don't pay any tax. Puerto Rico exempts it. 
So my brother who operates our business there, he's a Puerto Rico resident. He operates a Puerto Rico business that he owns. He receives a dividend. It's tax-free. So he has a 4% effective tax rate on his earnings from our company. Me, on the other hand, I live in South Florida. I'm embedded in our community. I've got young children. I really like raising them here in our suburban environment. And I didn't want to move. That wasn't appealing to me. So what I did is I set up the ownership of my company inside of a Roth 401k plan. Now, the benefits of a Roth plan, for the listeners that don't know, is that we pay tax on the money going in and we never pay tax on that money again. So when I set up that company, it didn't cost me very much to set up. I made a small deposit into my 401k account. I paid some tax by converting it to a Roth. And that company now owns the majority of my Puerto Rico business. So when we have, let's just say, a million dollars of income, we pay 40,000 of taxes, 960,000 goes out as a dividend distribution. I pay no tax on that dividend. It goes into my Roth 401k. I can invest that in real estate. I can invest that in the stock market. I can make private loans. All of the interest, dividend, and capital gains on those investments are tax-free. And when I turn 59 and a half, I could take as much or as little of that money out as I want, also tax-free. What is Agent Ignite? Are you wondering how you can make more money and create a competitive advantage for yourself and your clients in this ever-competitive real estate industry? Agent Ignite is the key to furthering your knowledge, establishing your expertise, and positioning yourself as a go-to expert. They deliver new and relevant knowledge so you can expand your clientele, close more deals, and ultimately increase income. Each month features a new guest speaker who will deliver on what is most relevant for your business. As a member of DMAR's Market Trends Committee, an avid champion for building wealth through real estate, and a self-proclaimed data geek, Nicole will share market trends and commentary that will add value to you and your clients. Staying up to date on industry statistics coupled with niche topics delivered by industry experts will help you motivate your buyers and sellers and make you more money. Sign up for the next Agent Ignite session at theruthteam.com slash events. Our guest is Mark Pierce. Thanks for being on the show, Mark. Well, you're welcome, Whitney. I'm glad to be here. Mark is an attorney, an accountant, and the owner of Cloud Peak Law. With over three decades of experience, Pierce has truly seen it all, at least from a legal perspective. This is apparent from the diversity of of fields in which he assists clients all over the years. Uh, Those fields range from bankruptcy and real estate planning to oil and gas and securities. So, Mark, I'm grateful to have you on the show. You know, why don't you give the listeners a little more about uh, who you are and what you do a little bit, maybe where you're located, and and let's dive into some of these issues that, uh, you know, around that I know other operators are having. I know I've received some questions lately that, you know, you and I uh, discussed briefly before we started recording uh, that I want to get into today that, uh, that I know is going to help the listener. But uh, give us a little more about who you are and, and uh, your, your business. I'd be glad to. Uh, Cloud Peak Law is located in Sheridan, Wyoming. Wyoming is an isolated state, to say the least, the least populated state in the United States. We have, uh, in terms of social distancing, 4.8 people per square mile. So I'm not sure what they mean by the social distancing for us anyway. It is the premier LLC jurisdiction in the United States, the first state to recognize and to uh, uh, flush out what a limited liability company is. It also has become one of the premier trust jurisdictions in the United States as well. And that's by design. Uh, the large financial industries within the state have pushed that to a conclusion. So I came back to Wyoming in uh, 2012, eight years ago, for the purpose of providing commoditized legal services to people in a very specific area, those being LLCs and trusts. Over the last eight years, we've put together a trust and LLC formation and operation administrating entity that allows people to get good, quick information regarding LLCs and trusts online and to book online consultations with attorneys as well, who are schooled almost solely in trust and LLC administration. That's just begun to take off within the last couple of years. And I hope that you will visit our website and take a look through those through that information because there's a great deal of information that you can go over there that relates directly to the real estate industry. So as a result of that, I brought my son in. We've got three or four programmers working for us now, several attorneys, administrative assistants, and all of that. 
Wow. Well, Mark, again, I'm grateful to have you on the show. And, you know, uh, uh, just so the listeners know, you know, I've had numerous questions recently about, you know, how do we structure once, once somebody gets into this business, which is, is not an easy feat, uh, but you get going, you get your business operating, uh, but then you start, you know, you have other growing pains, right? And, and one of those is then you have to, people start thinking about, well, you know, how do I structure these things on the personal side? You know, as an operator, well, then we start, you know, owning parts of different deals, Maybe we're investing passively as well. You know, we're thinking about, you know, our family and our kids and, and all these things start happening, right? You know, that maybe didn't happen before. I know it happened to me and I started to do a lot of research and consult with people like yourself. Uh, but I thought maybe you could help us talk through that a little bit. And, and even then us maybe get into, you know, why the Wyoming entity or LLC is so popular. Because uh, I, I know, you know, that came up as well, uh, you know, during many of these conversations. So, uh, but just on the personal side for an operator, you know, just thinking through our structure of our entities and whether we should have a corporation and, you know, what falls under those. And maybe you have some suggestions or ways that we can think through those things. Well, I have a definite prejudice towards limited liability companies just because I've been involved with them for the last 40 years in and out of this state. I mean, I've practiced in Florida. I practiced in uh, Colorado, California, Arizona. And it seems to me that the limited liability company gives you at least as much, if not more protection in terms of liability than a corporation does, but it also allows you the flexibility of being taxed in the way that you want to be taxed. Uh, an LLC can be taxed as a pass-through entity, like a sole proprietorship, as a partnership, as, as, as an S corporation, or as a C corporation. So from the standpoint of tax flexibility, you get a lot more with that LLC than you would with a corporation. But you also get to pick and choose which aspects of the LLC code you want to apply to you. And then you can modify a great number of those applications. And for instance, Wyoming has what they call a closed limited liability supplement so that you don't have to go through the regular corporate formalities and, and, and pretend that you've had a meeting every year, for example. You also don't have to have special meetings to uh, to adopt certain matters such as liquidations or asset acquisitions or dispositions. So it gives you a lot more flexibility in the standpoint of running a small business, which most of us have. So when you get into real estate syndication, by way of example, is that you know, you're, you're looking at getting a property and then you get the property and you put, you know, you, you, you begin running that property and going through all of those issues and then you get a second property and then you get a third. And then it just becomes inevitable that you end up with more and more properties. The problem is you don't keep up on the corporate side with what it is that you're doing. You wake up one day and say, my goodness, somebody points out and said, everything's at risk for everything else's liability. So you begin segregating them out into operating entities. Well, that's fine, but each one of those operating entities should probably locate it in the state where that real estate is, because it's not going to make any difference if you have a Wyoming company in Missouri. Missouri's probably going to pro apply Missouri law, even though they shouldn't. That's what they're going to do. So you realized I need to put each one of the operating entities into a separate LLC. What do I do with my passive interest? Because I've run into some things with that as well. So you put together a collective holding company at the top, which holds each one of those operating subsidiaries. Now the holding company can also be an LLC because an LLC can hold other LLC interests. And then off to the side, you put a management company because then you get more deductibility on your expenses. You get a broader definition of what an expense is so it lowers your, lowers your tax implications. Plus, if a management company is running those operating subsidiaries, you can, you can uh, commingle all the funds, which you cannot do if you're operating those subsidiaries individually. So the management company takes all the money into a, si a single pot, provides all the insurances that go on, provides all the operating expenses that go on, and then makes an accounting to each one of those entities at the end of every year, including a fee for running the management company. And that ultimately is where any real estate syndication company is going to come into play. Nice. Okay. That, that's a lot to think through right there. And you laid it out very, uh, very quickly and, and it makes it seem so easy, right? Uh, makes it seem so easy. Well, so, we've, we've drawn pictures on the website for you. I know that I'm very visual and it helps yes. me to look at these things from the standpoint of, you know, where are your squares, where are your triangles, where are your circles? And then to see the cash flows back and forth and begin to understand what it is that I'm talking about. And that's your legal structure. 
Nice. I, I look forward to looking at those uh, at those diagrams myself because I'm also very visual. I'd love to see that and be able to draw on it and think about, you know, where that money flows. And it took me a while to figure those things out. Now, wait a minute, you know, this entity, how is this entity related to this entity? And are they related or can they be or should they not be, you know, and money flowing from one to the other? You know, are, is that, uh, you know, is that like, top entity is that you know that holding these other entities is it owning those entities is money going to the first entity and then distributed to the others you know can you walk through a little bit of that yeah i'd be glad to and, and i think that's one of the best questions you get because even with a closed limited liability supplement applicable to your llc you have to watch the money flow because that's what's always going to trip you up so if you have a subsidiary that's generating money you wouldn't take that excess money and just invest it in another subsidiary directly you'd want to strip that money up to the holding company. It's called equity stripping. You maintain enough equity in that operating subsidiary to provide for its day-to-day -day operations, typically two to three months with no revenues. Anything over that, you strip up to the holding company. The holding company then makes additional investments into operating subsidiaries that need working capital, but it does it in the form of debt. That way it becomes a preferred creditor, not an equity holder, or a combination of an equity holder for its initial investment, but a, a creditor as to any additional cash infusions going in. So it invests, that pro it invests that in with a promissory note, secures it either with real estate or personal property or both, and then it strips that money away over time in the form of distributions going back to repay, to repay the loan that's been made, which is a huge differential on your accounting because now it's a repayment of a loan, not a repayment of capital. So if you start stripping money back up to that LLC and the taxes haven't been paid, then the LLC ends up paying the taxes first on income before it gets a return of its equity. Whereas if you distribute the, the uh, debt repayment back up, you don't have that worry. And that's a huge impact on a small business owner over time in terms of his cash flow. So you, have, you put the equity stripping in place and then the holding company ends up with the money. And then the holding company can invest in new subsidiaries or make capital infusions into older subsidiaries or keep that money and distribute it out to the limited liability company holders, the members, which is key because that gives you a double envelope of protection. That way, each one of those LLCs at the bottom, the operating subsidiaries are not liable for one another's debts and the holding company isn't liable for debts. And you as an owner behind the holding company have a double envelope of protection as to those debts within those LLCs. Wow. And that's something that's been put into place in Standard Oil of Ohio in the 1880s. So it's not as if we've come up with a new idea. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.